Welcome to this week's Treasury Career Corner podcast, where I interview Treasury professionals about their Treasury careers. Each and every week, I talk to treasurers about how they build their careers, where they are now, where they see both themselves and the Treasury profession going to next. And a special thanks to Flywire, our fantastic sponsors. If you've ever wondered whether there was a way to ease your international transaction hassles, they're the guys to talk to. If you follow the link in our show notes, you can see me talking to my mate Greg Levin, their senior VP of sales. I get to ask Greg about who are Flywire and how they can help you and your treasury team with your cross-border payment headaches. Just follow the link to the interview in today's show notes. And now let's get on with the show. I hope you listened to last week's show where we had a Kyriba live in Vegas with three amazing treasury professionals. This week, we head off to Texpo in Houston. Uh, it was amazing. Met with Tamara and Fred. You're going to get a great podcast in front of the room. And again, we've got another great one next week in London. And then we've got the follow-up with Windy City Summit in Chicago. So enjoy this week's show and looking forward to the next few weeks as well. Good afternoon, Houston. Oh, we are awake. Thank goodness for that. So welcome to this afternoon's Treasury Career Corner Live. We've got an amazing panel for you. You see them here. Well, see them sitting here, but you'll see them big on the screen in a moment. Go through the structure of this afternoon's session. First of all, we have a few house rules. You're all very busy, and I'm not picking on you, but you will see in a minute. Anyone with a phone, you've made the trip here. I've come a few thousand miles to do it. So stick your phones on silent, put them away, give yourself an hour for your careers because you've got two amazing panellists and a crazy English recruiter. Sorry about that. So who am I? Someone who can't pick up a microphone. So I'm Mike Richards. Sorry about the big head, but you can't have everything. So I've been a Treasury recruiter for 25 years. I recruit all levels, from Treasury analyst to global treasurer, globally. That literally is West Coast. So last week was in Vegas for Kyriba Live. Yeah, didn't go to the slots, don't worry. My risk management's better than that. <laughs> but a good conference, did Treasury Career Corner Live. We're doing it this week, and then do it on Thursday back in London. How did I come about doing this? That's the team. They're a lot prettier than me, and less big heads. So I started a podcast back before COVID, and these are two amazing, of my, my amazing guests of mine. So I thought, let's talk to some treasurers about their treasure careers. I thought we'd do 10 episodes. We're now at 320. Yes, it's on those little-known platforms called Apple. It's on Spotify. Everyone was asking me last week. 320 episodes, 150,000 downloads, some of the best treasurers that you'll get to meet. And we talk about their treasury careers, how they started, just like many of you here, the choices they made, and then they talk about some of the issues they see coming with treasury. And that's exactly what we've got here with Tamara and Fred. We're going to talk through their careers, some of the choices they've made. And as Tony Robbins says, success leaves clues. So try and pick up some clues from these very successful treasurers. This is how we're going to do it. They're both going to introduce themselves. I'll then quiz them a little bit more. There will be Q&A later on, about 10, 15 minutes from the end, and then we'll give you some takeaways. So without further ado, I'll let my first guest, Tamara, explain who she is and what she does. Over to you. It's a pleasure for me to be here sharing my career with you all. So um, I started my career as a really corporate finance analyst. I first did some FP&A. I did my postgrad uh, in the UK. I'm originally from Argentina. That's where I was born and, and raised. I did my postgrad abroad, Argentina, came back. And I started working in a very, very large company. And I, from the day one, I, and I cannot thank you enough, my manager at the time and mentor, that she exposed me to very senior management from, from the very beginning. 
I work in capital markets, long-term financing, structured finance, hedging, and I really enjoy it. And with that company, I came to the US, essentially as a CFO of our subsidiaries here. The companies grew. I was doing with as a CFO, investor relations, project financing, CFO, implementing ERPs, overseeing, and that was implementing the ERP systems. It was a real stretch. Our company was a European company, oil and gas company, headquartered in, in Europe. So it was a stretch from every angle that you can imagine. And I, again, cannot thank for that opportunity to the group CFO that promoted to that role. As the role and the companies and the businesses here expanded, I became the regional treasurer. And I continue growing, setting up, I mean, a trading floor, natural gas trading floor, power trading floor, which was really uh, very, very interesting. I then moved to Early Kid, which is my uh, current employer. And with them, I grew geographically. I oversee, so I'm the regional treasurer and the VP of M&A. So I oversee both functions for all of the Americas, uh, which means from Canada to Argentina, 11 countries. The Americas hubs represent around 40% of the group revenue. The US, uh, 38%. And in that journey, we did career implementations, very large integrations of treasure integration, change management. And now, uh, two years ago, I was promoted to also oversee M&A, which is finance, but more business-like and I'm enjoying it very, very much. So, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation and to Fred and really to your questions as well. Fred, over to you. Brilliant. Fred, over to you. Brilliant. Fred Shackney, it's nice to be here with you all. My treasury career started in high school. I was the class treasurer of my, my sophomore year <laughs> in high school. I don't think I knew what treasurer meant at the time, but my good friend was running for president. He said, you should run for something. I said, what's left? There's treasurer's left. So I in, in college, I was interested in economics, not because I knew what economics was prior to taking an economics class, but it seemed kind of nice. I liked the graphs, the charts, and all of that, and it seemed cool. So I knew I wanted to go into finance, economics, markets. I had an international background which led me to a bank trading floor overseas. And so I spent the first five years of my career in a trading room and a couple of years trading spot FX, which was exciting, like bids and asks and, and you know, all day, all, all, all along. But kind of monolithic, kind of narrow in scope. And I also spent two years on corporate sales, so talking with treasurers. And I thought it was really interesting, all the different things that they were doing. And so that prompted my interest in kind of moving from the banking world to the practitioner world. And so after graduate school, MBA, I shifted over into corporate treasury. And I worked for various companies in different industries, um, Lucent Technologies, formerly Bell Labs, then Alcatel, now Nokia and was there for kind of the top and the bottom of the roller coaster and lived through another roller coaster, another company, another industry, Constellation Energy. Went to Hilton after that and spent 11 years there and, and it was a fantastic stretch of time, which ended rather abruptly with COVID and now with, with Technip FMC here in Houston. So I have... I've never gotten, I would say, any level of depth in, in, this, in the industry knowledge of any company that I've been a part of. You should say, like, you know, for 11 years, you should know something. But I've bounced around industries a lot. However, and, and that has its positives and negatives. I thankfully have seen companies that are private and public, companies that are high yield and investment grade, companies that are going through M&As and going through spinoffs. And so coming away from all of that, I, I take away that, that the fundamentals uh, across the, the treasury principles across all these companies is exactly the same. 
also, every company that I've ever worked for has the exact same snowflake syndrome of thinking we are so unique, no one else can possibly have the challenges we have. And what I also have taken away is that the, well, if I, if I look at my, my career in context, they're going from sort of trading floor to treasurer. I went into the trading floor because I didn't want to have to deal with people. I just, I am an introvert, I, I like numbers, I wanted to only work at numbers. And I realized that like you can get some success out of just learning how to manage positions, data, numbers. It took about three, four, or five years to realize that just managing the results wasn't gonna get you everywhere. I had to understand the process, what was upstream and downstream, how to manage the information flow, and how to optimize all of that. And if you do that, you can kind of like every, you know, carry everyone up and down with you. And that worked out kind of nicely for a couple of years as well. And then I realized eventually that that's only getting you so far as well, and that to really succeed in this, in this game is, it's, is about managing people. And, and that's, it took me a while, <coughs> excuse me, to appreciate the importance of communication and the importance of culture and all the other things that kind of make for it a successful team. And, and that's kind of where I've kind of come full circle and realizing like I, I don't want to spend my time looking at numbers and spreadsheets. I'd rather, you know, but in, in, I'd much rather have the opportunity to kind of like give others that opportunity and, and, and bring the team together. So. I'm going to say both of you heavily involved in AFP and education. We're going to just explore that. But before we do that, I wanted to come back to something you said, Fred, because I know that you did this when we spoke on the podcast, and then I'll pass it to tomorrow as well. You said you bounce through industries, you know, and some of the people in this room will go, is it time for me to make a move? Should I go somewhere different? Or should I see out a role a bit longer? I know you've made those moves quite deliberately in a positive way throughout your career. How would you... What recommendations would you give to the people in this room? And then we'll ask Tamara. Yeah, absolutely do it. I mean, it's literally not that hard at all to shift from a treasury job in one industry company to another. Again, the rules, the fundamentals of the principles of managing cash and debt and liquidity and risk are all exactly the same. They've been the same for hundreds of years and they will remain the same. You just need to under, you, you need to go into it understanding how to, how to appreciate this, the circumstantial differences. Is it a B2B or a B2C type of a business model? As well as, is it a, a high yield or, 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 or investment grade balance sheet? That affects how you think about managing liquidity. So understanding the circumstances is the key, but when you can, when you can, when you can understand that, you can apply the exact same set of rules. Same, I think, I mean, if you have the opportunity to bounce industries, and this is one of the uh, beauties of treasury. I mean, you need to understand the underlying of the industry, but, you know, we are agnostics in terms of how we manage cash, how we have visibility over cash, what we streamline working capital, how we issue a, a bond. I mean, really, the, the process and the expertise is the same. The underlying business will be different, but that's, and that's what you need to, to learn. I mean, how to grasp uh, that underlying uh, industries. And then there are easier moves. I mean, if you are in oil and gas, petrochemical is not that different. I move from oil and gas in general to oil and gas upstream to then, you know, industrial gases. The, to understand the cycle, I mean, it's capital intensive if you go to petrochemicals or chemicals. It's not that different. So, so that's the, the beauty of treasury. Absolutely bouncing, it's great. And can, if I can add one other thing on the back of, of that is um, that's the upside is it's, it's, it's not that hard. The downside is you still at some point need to understand the business. And if you've grown up in that industry, that can be a lot easier. It's, I, I still wouldn't go so far as to say that I am an expert in what Technip FMC does. I still have a lot to learn. It's highly complex and the markets are complex. But the other, as a strategy for coping with that, you ha so not only you know, you know, know it yourself, but surround yourself with people who do. And so as one example, my assistant treasurer came in from FP&A and from financial operations 
and he has spent his entire career in the company and the industry, and he does have that knowledge, so, and yet he's coming in treasury fresh. So it's a sort of a complementary skill set. And just on that about, we talked there about, we've got a room full of people who are getting CTP credits for coming along here. I know you're both very pro AFP, you've been on the board, you are on the board and everything else. Looking back at your younger selves, obviously a couple of days ago, not very long ago, um, but joking aside, you're successful treasurers, and that this is all very well for you guys to say, well, you're treasurers, yeah. Pro CTP, pro study, education, qualifications, I'll go Tamara first and then Fred. You know, why do you think so powerful with maybe your more junior members of your teams as well? I, I, I am very much pro CTP. I took it when I just arrived to the US. It was a way also to certify my knowledge here. And besides getting you know, to know people and to, and to network. But you know, in the universities, in, in the school, you are, there is not that treasury. So, so really, I mean, the CTP in this case, it is a way to get more hands on. Uh, on, on really the technical, the technical knowledge. So, so I think it is important. I think I did my career very conscious of the north that I wanted to have, and it was a very much vertical, you know, specializing, specializing, and, and, and getting seniority in that. Today, I might say move around, you know, get out of treasury. Treasury can be, you know, very highly dependent. You want to be in treasury first and you stay in treasury for all your life. But I think that kind of moving around, getting into sales, getting into FP&A, for example, it's, it's really good. You know, having the north and coming back to treasury or moving around, I think it adds to the wealth of your treasurer profile. Yeah, also very much pro CTP. Uh, I will admit that I took the CTP myself after joining the board of the AFP, and I was sort of nudged and saying, hey, you probably should, should look into taking this. And I did, and, and through a misfortune of bad planning, I had about two days to cram to take this thing, which was just a bad planning on my part. But what I, look, I learned from it is there was a... What we will say, Fred, is we're not recommending that to the room. Yes, okay? that's, a, that's, that's not a recommended strategy. Yeah. Definitely do not do that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. The, um, but, what, but I learned there was a hell of a lot I didn't know. I had spent, at that point, I don't know, 20-something years in Treasury myself, and, all, and there was a lot that I'd never even heard of before, frankly. And there's a, a, one of the big advantages of learning is learning what you don't know. And you don't have to know everything. You don't have to be an expert in all aspects of Treasury. But the more that you know about you know, what kind of questions to ask and to be aware of and to go to someone who does have the expertise is very, very essential in terms of being able to, to rise up the ladder. And I think for recruiting as well, I mean, I, you know, somebody, I'm looking into treasury, somebody that has the certification to me, you know, it's a differentiator. Yeah. Up on the list here, we've got from education, what's been key to your success, mistakes, challenges. One of the key things, not an advertorial, but for the podcast, someone asked me the other day, they said, look, you interview, you know, you were going to do 10 episodes, you're on 320. How do you keep it fresh? And I said, I don't need to. You guys as treasurers do. Because each of you, and we were, I was at Eurofinance a couple of years ago, and someone said, well, how do you... I said, look, we've got 10 treasurers within 10 feet of me. They're like, oh, yeah. I said, they're all the same, right? I'm like, well, no. I said, no, so one's debt-laden, one's cash-rich, one's a private company, one's a different... And you've all taken different routes to success as it is now. I'll come to Fred first and then back through tomorrow. Looking back over your careers, any points that you would, you know, bring up that you think that this audience, you know, maybe mistakes you made you know, or things you wouldn't want to repeat again and maybe recommendations you've given to your team? Fred first. I mean, the, the one thing I would not recommend from my own past is being as, as sort of narrowly planted as I have been. So, so I started out, I mentioned, on a trading floor FX. I have never, with the exception of maybe a year, not had some association with foreign exchange. I would recommend to anybody at any stage in their career, bounce around back and forth, you know, spend a year or two here and then there and then there. Learn, a lot, learn enough 
that you can speak with some authority on it. But I would recommend, unless you're super dedicated to it, don't get planted into one single thing. Um, yeah. Over to you, Tamara. A little bit the same, a little bit what, what I said. I would recommend to move around, even get out of the functions. And the earliest you do it in your career, the less costly it is if you made a mistake. You know, to move uh, to another function when you are a senior manager or an assistant treasurer and, and you cannot handle it or you don't like it, I mean, to come back, it might be more difficult. Instead, I mean, when you are starting your career, really you can move, understand, I mean, get connected, and then bring all of that to, to your treasury career. I walk it through, like, I mean, okay, you have to be analyst, manager, director, VP, that career trend, I think, in today's world is less usual. You, can, you don't want to be just identified that you can only do treasury, and then you cannot move, and you are locked in, and the treasury profession is more smaller, so or it's getting you know really really tight. So, so you you need to find your way. You need to show your company that you have the flexibility to handle different problems from different angles. And if I could add one one other point to that is there's something to be said for knowing a little bit about different functions. I think there's also something to be said for being able to operate in different types of teams and for different leaders and, and overseeing different teams. I'm, as I'm sure many of you, I have worked for people who knew how to do my job better than me and, and who didn't, had never done my job. And likewise, have had peers and, and teams with different levels. Of, and being able to adapt to those different environments is, is very key because as a matter of career progression, Sooner or later, you're going to be in charge of stuff that you've never done before, never heard of before. And having that ability to react and, and flex, to, to oversee somebody who's done something that you've never done before and be able to add some value to what they do is, is an important skill. Thank you. I'm going to come to Tamara about this. We've talked about you've embedded your Treasury team members across different regions. Yes. We actually have one of your uh, colleagues, Vivian, here today. I know we talked about this on the podcast as well. How have you made that work? And again, this might be any of the Treasury people here, practitioners thinking, oh, should I put my hand up for that move? What should I do? Should I be open to it? What would you recommend? And then again, we'll go to Fred after. And I think, I mean, nowadays, with all shared service centers being located in different geographies, it's something that it will happen. I mean, the matter is when. Uh, being able to work with your team all located in one place and directed what is going to happen in, you know, if you, you're working on a global company or even if you are in the U.S., that it's uh, becoming more, more difficult. So on one end, it was a global initiative to, to create the shared service centers, uh, but I took it to the point. I took the opportunity to go even further than what the company was uh, really looking for, and we generated you know, essentially two different teams. One center of excellence, more for advisory, corporate finance uh, matters. And, you know, we have our cash, pure cash management is located now in, in Argentina. And the teams are now in Colombia, in Argentina, in the U.S., certainly, and you have to manage that. Uh, it's interesting. It's exhilarating. It's very challenging because obviously you are adding to cultural differences. I don't think that anybody here working in the U.S. will have a challenge necessarily uh, to do that. But yeah, obviously you need patience. You need to, you know, communication. To, to Fred's earliest point, communication is essential, and then you know misunderstandings are more frequent. But I think that setting and guiding, setting the goals, guiding the conversation, setting the level of expectation so everybody really can uh, be up to that uh, is the same whether you are working with one team located in one geography or you have your team spread out. Fred? Yeah, we have a, a very geographically dispersed team in, in 12 or so locations in just the treasury piece and is, is part of the evolution that we're going through right now. And 
as, as a takeaway, and every treasurer I've been in has had some level of that, but as a general takeaway, I would say your people largely are going to be where they are. That's the decentralized piece. Your financial positions, your money, your debt, needs to be as centralized as you possibly can be for a financial efficiency. What holds all that together is your information and your data. Your information has to be ubiquitous, global, you know, om omnipresent all the time so that everybody knows what's going on all the time. And that's just a system problem to solve. What we are doing in right now is going, so we're coming from a very decentralized approach to a, what we're evolving towards is, is, is really five global functional teams. <laughs> Capital liquidity, financial market risk, credit, insurance, and infrastructure. And so the end state is that we've got people all different countries who need to be able to act globally. And that presents, as you all know, a bunch of challenges. So I mean, policy is the easy thing to fix. Then you've got legal entity authorizations to map through. Then you've got tax substance, presence questions to, to sort out as well, as well as just kind of what you can do <laughs> with one banking environment or another. So there's, there's, there's a lot of complexity to that puzzle, but the goal is to get to an, an environment in which you can operate globally. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of suffice to say, it's not a scalable model to have every, everything fully decentralized at the country level, nor is it efficient, or nor is it in the benefit of everybody's career interest as well. So we're trying to build something that's better for our employees and that more career opportunities to kind of act on a global basis and get involved in stuff. But there is a lot of tax, legal, govern, you know, regulatory puzzles to, to figure out on the way. So you are both treasury leaders, but who has had an impact on you? Again, we'll go to tomorrow first. I've, again, I had Karen van der Driesche, amazing treasurer over in Belgium many years ago. She said to me, we're going to have her back on the podcast about having a mentor. Now, for her, it was one of her ex-bosses. And the thing that she loved about it was, her words, not mine, she could be crazy. She could come up with what felt like a crazy idea, but in a safe environment. And it was, you know, I remember doing that podcast and just thinking, wow, this is great. That's one of the things she found with having a mentor. She could then rehearse different things. She come up with crazy, what seemed like crazy ideas, but actually underneath that there weren't stupid ideas they were just like if we were to do this you know we've got ai coming on lots of different things have you had that experience yourself and, and maybe then also the second part of that and you as mentors so maybe reflect on both you know we'll split it up maybe so my mentors uh, from my first manager that she did it without really explicitly understanding uh, or, or or really saying you know this is something important for your career uh, but she she really realized that I have the technical expertise. I come in young. It was a company that was just privatized, so she came from the old state-owned environment. I came fresh from, you know, college, etc. So we have a good blend, and she could really read the tea leaves of the changing times at that time. My former bosses, most of them, have been my mentors, and they have pushed me to come here and I reach out to them, even if they are in Argentina or in Spain, I sometimes, I mean, keep in touch uh, with them. So I have been able to find mentors in my current uh, working company at the time. And then I have, you know, this couple of friends, women, professionals, senior executives, and that kind of your board of directors, just conversations that we have. And there have been a great support to, you know, your point on, okay, I would like to do this, or, or what do you think? And they really challenge me. So I think that what essentially you need is somebody that can challenge you and push you to really uh, do your next steps or present a certain project. I think we need to get out of our comfort zone as much as possible. Do I mentor? Yes, I mean, with our company, I was also very much active in the women's uh, professional networking in Houston, and we also have networking for women or within the early kid, Alwin women's net networks, and we also have mentoring there. So very active on that, but I definitely think that mentors, 
are good for you all throughout your career and you need to look for those people which are different than sponsors. Sponsors are then more strategic. Those are the ones that are going to say, I want this individual here within a company. So you need to look for both, actually. Fred? Yeah, I, I have had the opportunity to work for a number of, of very bright treasury professionals. I think I've worked for at least four or five, maybe more alumni of, of General Motors Treasury, which produces a lot of talent and they kind of go over. So lots of very, very bright people. The one name that really sticks out, and, and sadly because she recently passed away, Denise McGlone was a boss of mine at, at Lucent for a number of years. And she, I would credit her with, with help. She saw things that I was doing that I didn't realize I was, I, I was doing, good things. She saw in me stuff that I didn't see in myself and really helped me appreciate more of, of how to grow and how to become a leader. So I really credit her and thank her for that. So we're going to come to, not, we're not at Q&A yet, we've still got a bit of time, but I want you in the audience to really reflect on what you've heard so far, but also how often do you get to ask two amazing treasurers these questions? You can ask me, but I won't come up with good answers. Just ask these two, okay? But so I will be going to that in about 10 minutes. But how do you both keep yourselves motivated? Maybe we'll start with Fred this time to take off, you know, and advice for the audience members on motivation. Is it just, yeah, you just go up and you just do your treasury job every day because... I know straight after this, you've got to dash off for a you know board meeting, and you know that there's it's a heck of a you know a heck of a lot of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, you feel like that. It's, it's, it's not a board meeting, but it's, it's I'm dashing to something else. But yeah, the, yeah. the you know we, we it's a subject of motivation that I've, I've I've talked about quite a lot with with my direct team and and broader team as well, and. You know, we, we spend a heck of a lot of time talking about KPIs and KSFs and goals and objectives and, and how it all ties together to shareholder value and you got mapping through it all because we're all finance people ultimately. And that's important for everybody to know and understand and be able to internalize and communicate. But at the end of the day, no one really cares. I mean, that's not why you get up in the morning and that's not why you fight because like, you know, it's it's living through the days that I know you all live through as well is a fight. And, and you, you don't do that because you're like, I got us like marginally closer to a, a, another penny a share. You do it because of your colleagues, your comrades, your friends. And you do it because you know like if you're trying to improve, you're trying to make something better, you want your colleagues and your friends and your teams to benefit from that too. So it's really about a, a human connectivity, which is why, you know, realizing post-COVID the value of just face-to-face -face engagement with people, you, you know, as much as Teams is great, you, you can't build that without all of the synapses that get built, you know, offline. And that's when you really appreciate kind of the value of what, you're, what you do and what they can do for you. And Tamara? I think it depends on, you know, at which level of uh, you are in your career. At the beginning, motivation should come from a desire to learn and, and do more so complex or sophisticated projects, to be part of a function, to add value to that function. And then it goes, okay, becoming a more strategic player at the table and be able to influence others and see how that you know, evolves, how you can learn something new I'm working now with a lot on project financing, which I did, you know, back in my career, and now it's all coming again. So I have, you know, this motivation. So, oh, wow, I mean, now it's, it's different, but it's the same. It's complex. So that keeps me motivated. But I think as a, as a team is continuous changing, continuous doing it, you know, a better, a better job, but really you know, getting connected with other and being able to to bring value and to influence and, and share, right? So sharing. And you both touched on the evolution of the workplace. I mean, the past five years has been crazy. You know, so, you know, way back in that February, it was like, well, we're coming into the office five days a week. This is what happens. 
March happens, right, you're staying at home in your basement. That's it. That's what everyone, did. and we're 100% remote. And then back into the office, and then remote again, then back and forth. And now, and you know, hybrid used to just be a car. And that was it. And everyone was like, wow, hybrid, what's that? And now, you know, everyone is still, I think, still struggling to get, you know, used to it. You know, without it being a conflict with your company organization, how do you organize it with your treasury teams? And again, we'll go tomorrow then, Fred, just to, you know, give you a break. But it's like, you know, what's, what was it like before? During and after, what, how does it work? So, so, so before we were, you know, in, in the office. After, yes, we have moved from totally remote or, or three to remote. We are now actually now. I mean, coming still three two in the office, but with two actual company wide days in the office. Everybody, we have lost a little bit of engagement, and we want everybody to be able to to work. And there is a lot of people that have never worked, I mean, full time, five days a week in the office. And they, you know, there is more struggle uh, there in terms of what well, I don't need. I mean, I've been doing my job like this for, for three years now. Uh, but there is value of uh, being together and being able to be uh, more efficient. Obviously, now that we have uh, our more geographically distributed uh, teams, Remote helps because it makes it levels it levels up for for everybody to be able to connect with your boss or with the boss of your boss. So that I think it's a, an advantage. What I really think that we should not do, or we need still to learn how to do, is to maximize those resources. It doesn't make a lot of sense to go to the office and have I mean Zoom calls all day long, like if you were in the in, at home. So I think that we haven't yet not you know, learned how to, okay, what do I need to do when I am with everybody and how can I do the most? And then when I, I am home, I, okay, it's my individual work, it's my catching up. So I think that's still most of us. We're just replicating in one place or the other the same way of working. And that's, I think, that we all, no matter which companies, really still need to learn a better way of working. Before I pass straight to you, Fred, we actually discussed this New York cash exchange last year. I had three great panellists. And one of the guys, Steve, the treasurer of Broadridge Financial, he talked about they'd gone through exactly this as a treasurer. And one of the things he'd noticed, they'd all come into the office one of the days. He went out, got his coffee at lunchtime, closed his office door, got to the end of it, went, hang on, guys, why are we doing this? You know, it, this was post, you know, as we start to come out of it, he said, actually, let's stop doing this. Now, he actually, he said he prefers, he's got quite a commute in, he prefers to work in the office because he can get a lot of focus work. But they got, and I think the, I'll have to look back at the notes, planned intentionality, I think it's called, or we, he came up, they came up with this phrase, it's, if you're going to come into the office, come in for a reason. Have some meetings with people, not just Zoom meetings. Yeah, you can have a Zoom meeting here or there, but do it to be with each other. And I think that's one of the things we're seeing. You know, I've been seeing text mode, like loads of people in the room. It's like, whoa, it's quite weird. You know, you got used to small groups. You got the, it's suddenly we're back into networking. And I think it proves that people want to be back together. Treasury by its very nature is social. Fred, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree. There, there's a, a, a number of truths here that are uh, difficult to reconcile, but it, each individually powerful. And so, so I, I remember it was probably about February of, of 2020. So in my prior role, I had a commute that was pretty hellacious, and I was kind of leaving the house early every morning, getting home late. Not, recent, not long ago, my son actually said to me, I wasn't sure if you lived at home those first couple of years. <laughs> and, but I remember it was like literally just before COVID hit, and I was on the way home one night at like 8 o'clock at night, I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is ridiculous. Like, something has to change in my life. And thankfully, you know, it, it did. Like, you know, like, so I spent a lot more time at home with my kids now, which is great. And that's fantastic. And that's not to be little at all the, the powerful benefit to us as human beings of, of that, that family time um, or whatever time it is for you. The, but, you know, yes, I mean, like, the, the in person meetings are so incredibly valuable. And I do think we've forgotten a little bit of that. Now, for, for us at Tech and FMC, 
We are a, an engineering company, manufacturing really complicated stuff. I don't know if the word obeya means the same, you know, something to everybody here, but it is very much integral to what we do as a company. So everything is kind of organized in this way. It's a sort of a way to bring people together. So we're, we're kind of moving in that way with, with, <laughs> with all of the uh, corporate functions too. In fact, I don't even have an office anymore. So it's the, but so as much as I know how powerful that in-person face-to-face meeting is, at the same time, you know, if you think back to like pre-COVID, we, a lot of us probably didn't necessarily know what our international colleagues even looked like because you, did, you weren't on video calls with them because you didn't need to be. And so now, like, you know, the great thing about COVID and Teams and Zoom and all that is it's a great equalizer. So whether somebody's like down the road or across the world, you have the same visual of them on the screen. So while, you know, screen is not as good as face-to-face, screen is a heck of a lot better for somebody who's around the world. And I think it's, been, it's really, really benefited the globalization of our communities. We're going to come to questions just after this question from me to both of you. We're talking about uh, <clears throat> many of the audience would love to have had careers like this. Any advice as you reflect back to your younger selves? I know we've touched on it two or three times, but just sort of summarizing, maybe we'll come to tomorrow first, that you look back and you've got junior colleagues and say, right, this is just my advice. You don't have to do it, you don't have to take it, but if I was to relive it or do it, what would you say? You have to be a team player. You have to be a good listener. You have to want to be able to be challenged and, and get out of the comfort zone. I mean, it, I think the, the more we learn is when we get these roles or these opportunities that really stretch us, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, this is, I mean, really difficult. But, I mean, those are the moments where you really learn to manage organization or senior management. or So, so I really think that, you know, getting exposed, it's not comfort, you know. The, but if you really want to grow, I think you need to show others that you can really manage that. I think that's... And, and, and be open to technology. I think it's... A lot of things are going to change, but it's going to be for, for the best, and we need to be prepared. And before I pass to Fred, I was just talking to my panellists before, and just to let you guys know, I hate public speaking. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, of course you do. But I was just explaining that I was in Chicago a few years, speaking at Windy City, and I was going to get people to share their one secret about themselves that people might not know. And I said, I don't enjoy public speaking. I've become much better at it. I've got, you can see I've got millions of notes. This gives me, and, you know, and then I've got better through talking to amazing treasure professionals like these two and many more on the podcast because I love talking treasury. That's where, you know, my comfort zone. But then to actually do it on a stage, that's where I got out of my own way and, you know, and present it. And I've got better and better at it. But I was saying again earlier, I get nerves. I get this tough just get over it because otherwise you're going to stand in your own way over to you fred yeah i mean likewise ditto to tomorrow ditto to you mike is i i have found various opportunities to speak at various events and intentionally because like yourself i i don't i'm not a public speaker i don't not this isn't my my safe space at all and but I knew that the only way to get better at it, to get more comfortable, is just practice and, and just allow yourself to make mistakes and say stupid things, not again. Um, so to recap a couple things, I would definitely recommend experiencing different functions uh, uh, earlier in your career. I would definitely recommend think about the leaders that you want to work with and for, and, it's, and you can learn different things from different types of people. Think about, you know, at the next step of your career evolution, what do you want to look back on in a year or three and say, I accomplished that, you know, and build, build those stories. And then, the, you know, in addition to kind of pushing yourself, like Mike said, the last thing is, is just kind of be somebody that people want to work with. And, and that's kind of the key to wanting others to include you in their, in their spheres. And again, to pick up in there, you said about practice. When I was first doing some of my speeches, as well, 
I stood there in the hotel room in Chicago and I'd seen an interview actually with Jimmy Carr. He's an English comedian, very, very funny guy. And someone asked him, they said, oh, do you practice? I was like, what? And they were like, oh, what, you don't? He went, of course I practice. He said, I do this, my comedy routine, 50 times to myself. I was like, wow. And he said, because then if I, it becomes rote. And he said, then he can freestyle. Then he can do other things. And I was doing some of those speeches 10, 15 times. So again, if you're thinking about doing it, again, for sessions like this, next year's Texpo, and someone says, will you be on the panel? Say yes. When I approach people for, to be on the podcast, what's also interesting, I think there is quite a difference. I noticed that actually in the US. Well, actually, let's start with Europe. In the UK, I'll ask someone, do you want to be on the podcast? They went, oh, send me the details. I'll think about it. Now, the great thing here, and you'll hear a lot of US treasurers, they have a different you know, ethos. It's like, yeah, I'll do it. Send me the details. And it makes it much easier because then we share about the pre profession and community and everything else. Now, we're going to come to some questions. Now, I was going to plant a couple, but I thought that's just too easy, so I'm not going to, I didn't. Questions from the audience. Oh, that, that, I love this. And I hand up straight away. This is a man that I could work with. So I have a question for all three. Have you noticed the diminishment in the role of the corporate treasurer? And when I say that, like that certain organizations the corporate treasurer may report to the VP, reports to the CFO, and so, you know, you don't have that power and influence. And if so, even if not, what tips do you offer to build a business case to help the organization see that the treasurer deserves, in my mind, a more prestigious profile within the organization? Who wants to answer it first? And I'll answer it third. Well, I've seen it both ways. I've seen it, I mean, tax take, taking treasury or, uh, as you mentioned, the VP, I mean, overseeing, a VP of finance overseeing treasury. But I also have seen how the treasurer has become more strategic player and has a voice on, on the table. So I think that's what really matters. Uh, does it report? I also have seen treasury taking on, on tax. So, so I cannot say that it has been diminished. But I think it depends on how strategic you are able to become. I mean, and, and I think that when we look today and forward and the importance of markets and liquidity and speed and, and that forward-looking uh, thinking, Treasury is really the one that can drive and, and help. It's more than FP&A because it has the whole market and banking relationship and, and bankers' view. Uh, and it's you know more com more more comprehensive, more holistic than just tax or other functions. Fred, yeah, I, I think it is. It's something I've seen myself from time to time, and I've seen it vary by company and industry and circumstance. Where I think the role of treasurer I've seen as being most valued has tended to be in companies with leadership at the CEO and CFO level with a capital allocation mindset. And where that exists, and that does exist in some companies more than others, not that it shouldn't exist everywhere, then I think it's an easier path. Where it doesn't exist, I think, is to help the, C the, the leadership build that capital allocation mindset. And where I've seen it, well, I was asked this a while ago to give a distinct, very definitive answer. They said, what do you think? And I said, well, it depends. <laughs> oh, thanks for that. I said, no, it depends on the CFO. You know, so what is their attitude to Treasury? You know, some may have been Treasurers, and I've seen that more and more. What I've also seen is CFOs that see Treasurers as their visionaries. They see them, oh, blockchain a few years ago. Oh, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to, you know, AI, how are we going to implement this? And on top of already busy schedules that Treasurers have, they've been used by their CFO as like the sort of root master. Can you go out and check this technology, filter it for me and bring it back? And a very distinct example, I have to be careful I don't say the name, but one of my treasurers, loving his job, great, visionary, he was like this, CFO changes. CFO walks in, right, so you look after the cash, right? So yeah, that's it. No, that's what my previous treasurer did. Yeah, and that's what you do now. And the next day, his resume gets on my desk. And I'm like, yeah, that's what will happen. Treasurers will vote with their feet. So that's where I've seen it in recruitment terms. So who else? Right, 
Uh, we'll go first here, and then we'll come to Jeremy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heidi with BNB. It's, it's a bank that has a lot of different countries. So I think both of you have managed teams that are all over the world. How do you retain the talent, but also encourage your global team to upscale and, and further their career progression? So thank you. And it's a, very, it's a very good question. I think, I mean, what Fred is working, it's a, a way of really giving opportunity of people in different countries to to have an equal opportunity. We've done it by centralizing and so smaller teams, more strategic roles. And I think that was a way to also to retain, recognize, I mean, when we moved to the, to the service center and to the COE, we really eliminated the treasure role in every country of our geographic region, which was you know, a big, big, big change, and a big change in, a, in the mindset. However, you know, some of those people were you know, now I'm in a regional role, not just a country role, not just more operational role, but you know, now on a much more regional, strategic, more exposure to the regional management. So, so I think that's how we allow I mean, more career opportunities. And, and then can we take that to the next level and do it at the global level? Well, that's a little bit, we're not there yet, but I think that from you know, my perspective, treasury is a centralized function in a sense and, and allowing, I mean, global functions of treasury be located in different places. That's how you allow, I mean, really good opportunities for, for everybody. Fred? I think the, so, so we have seen as well, coming from a very decentralized organization, a lot of people who are, you know, the, the, the country CFO, or, you know, the country treasurer, and we have, we have lots and lots of, and it, it breeds a, I don't want to say this in a demeaning way, it sort of breeds a mindset of like, my goal, my, my path to career progression is to be like the biggest fish in a small pond. And what we're trying to do in inverting that is to say, here's an opportunity to develop expertise at a global level, be it cash, credit, FX, whatever, and be able to operate at a global level and be able to sort of hop <coughs> uh, you know, out of different, I lost my analogy, out of different ponds, if you will, still located wherever you're located, but, but operating you know, outside of just that. And it is not, it, it's, it's a challenging thing because some people embrace that and get it and like, that's fantastic. But some people still want to be kind of the, the, the you know, I, I, the, the biggest fish in, in, in the small pond, if you will. And at some point, part of the strategy is you, you have to part ways. And, and if, if not everybody wants that same goal, that's okay, you know, and it's just being respectful and, and, and helping them find the right decision and, 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 and find a, a way out. Because, you know, the development for, in terms of career development, talent development, I have said this not out loud, but in public, and sorry, in private sessions, my goal for everybody in my team is career development. And if it's not with this company, it's with some other company. So I want to set you up for success so that, hey, if, if I can't promote you to whatever, and you get promoted somewhere else and you leave, you know, bad on us, but good for you, you know, and I'm glad that I have helped, helped you along the way. We've got time for one more question with Jeremy, because we've got some good, well, great takeaways from our panelists. Jeremy? It's been an interesting uh, session. Quick question. I think Treasury has typically been, I would say, the educator of the enterprise about cash management throughout the entire enterprise, from business operations and so forth. And Treasury, the Treasurer is usually the right hand man or woman of the CFO. So the question is that Treasury does not typically, it's not something you just study at the university. You kind of fall into it as you're on the way to the C suite because you have designs on the CFO. So since that you've been great treasurers, uh, would you say that this is your final destination or would you like to go to the CFO position to then also help educate the entire enterprise as well about the importance of the treasury position? 
It's a great question, but how did it do it? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, honestly, you know, I, I have spent my entire career in Treasury. I find it fascinating. Personally, would I like the larger challenge of a CFO role? Probably would. But I, maybe I'm being too transparent, I have no yearning desire that that's what I need myself to get to. But I agree with your, your assessment there. There is a bit of, of education which comes with the job, the territory of like outside world to inside world. And I, I like your, your taking that step forward of like, you know, shouldn't that be what the CFO does too? Totally agree. And so maybe in light of the way you're characterizing, maybe I should rethink how I think about my own, my own role. But I've, I've also talked to other treasurers, lifelong treasurers, who are perfectly happy being treasurers because that's kind of where, where, where their passion lies. Tomorrow? You know, CFOs, treasurers, it depends of what, I mean, it, it, CFO is a smaller, more simple company, private equity, is it treasurer of a larger public, more complex company? So I think that, yes, clearly there is, you know, the willingness to continue growing, but for example, in my case, taking on m and so it's opening other opportunities. So, you know, yes, treasurers have and will continue to be the key position for capital markets and, and for cash and, and, and liquidity. I clearly see that more and more there is more CFOs coming from the treasury track than the accounting track. I don't think that, there, you know, that we are there yet, but clearly there seems to be an evolution and, and it is this connection with markets, with analysts, with rating agencies, so that bringing that outside view to the company that, that really helps those CFOs that are very much coming from the accounting track, more you know, inside looking uh, and very strong on internal controls and audit. So I think yeah, the opportunities are, are there and it depends really for which company, I would say. So our panelists have got some great takeaways, so I don't want to run out of time. We've got three minutes or so, so we've got a minute, well, you can actually, yeah, with a, min, a minute, you can maybe pick out two or three, or which are your favorites? I, I talked in the past about the non, you know, getting out of the comfort zone, and I would like to close on my, and, and, and being a, a, a curious and a team player, but I really would like you all to reflect on Technology and technology is here. I think treasury will and treasury talent will need more data science and more data science based <coughs> skills. And it is our responsibility to understand. I don't think that AI will replace our jobs. What I do think, and this might be provocative for your next podcast, that somebody with good AI understanding, yes, will replace you. So, so on all of that, I think that continuing learning and understand the current state of the art is part of your responsibilities and you have to be good at. Yeah, and I've, I've seen it as well, becoming much more part of the toolkit of treasurers, but you've already had these massive toolkits anyway. And it's just replacing some of the ones that you perhaps are outdated, used to use this, actually this will replace four or five of them. Yeah. And yeah, it makes yeah the general profile yeah. of coming from finance and doing treasury, I think obviously we'll need that more, you know, generalist. But I think that we really need to complement with, you know, solid understanding of. So Tamara it also has working from home is great. Personal connections essential. I've also got that on mine. I didn't copy it from hers, although I did see it. But it was. Uh, I think that's a key one, which I'll reflect in a moment. Fred, for yours. So we yeah. are. First of all, ditto to all of that. I agree with what you're saying. And kind of that's what the, the first four bullets are sort of getting at. The, I'm, I'm going to jump to the last one, which is, so be yourself every day. It's kind of, it is to some degree an, a, a comment on, on diversity in that for our organizations to be successful, everybody has to not only feel included, but want to contribute. It is, so recently I had my direct reports together for three days and we spent the first half a day just talking about psychological safety as a, as a concept. How do we 
how do we promote that and, and, and live that ourselves? Because I'm sure that not one person in this room doesn't understand the concept of imposter syndrome. And if you, you know, if, if, if you come to work and you're afraid to ask questions or you're afraid to make a statement because you think somebody else might not think it's the smartest thing to say, that's how organizations, you know, become decrepit. And so to have that, you know, to be, to grow as individuals and to grow as a team, we need to bring ourselves to the office every day and feel comfortable. And as, as leaders, we need to make sure that we, we promote that type of, of climate environment. And mine? Well, connecting. You've seen there's a lot of the business cards out there, so do connect. But actually, I think one of the ones that I've liked at each of the sessions, Vegas, we're doing London later this week, is actually being here it would have been easier to watch a virtual session. It would have been easier not to travel to Houston, but you've made the effort. So give yourselves a round of applause for that in a moment. In a moment, wait for it, wait for it. I know, you don't get out of here yet. Yeah, you can do the questions. If you've got individual questions, we'll be around afterwards. But one of the other bits is about taking notes. And that is one of the things about, and it, again, what our panelists have talked here about is making meaningful connections. Now, that's not just with us, and we'll be doing this actually at AFP about networking and how to effectively network. So when it's out there, what you might want to find is if you're talking to someone this evening, if you haven't had too many margaritas, so quite early on at Tommy Bahamas, you'll meet someone. They'll be of interest to you. You think, actually, I've got something in common with them. Don't just immediately, oh, quick, let's LinkedIn. Why? You don't know them. Get to know them. And Chris Fulton, very good friend of the business, he is, he says he's not a master networker. He's wrong. He's brilliant. Because what he does, he will take a business card. Let's do this is a big example. So a chat to someone. And then sometimes you're drifting off. He'll say, sorry, can you give me a second? And he will make a note on each one of these. And I've recently had him, also Dana laid hold on the podcast in New York. And they are very, very good networkers. Not deliberately just doing it, oh, just for their careers. As both Chris Cochan and, Cochan and uh, Dana said, they were getting all their jobs, not through me. I had a go at them. We're not doing that anymore. I said, they've got to come to me. But joking aside, they got it through their networks. So don't underestimate the power of the networking here. You've made the effort to come here to Texmo to get to know people. Now you can put your hands together for these amazing panelists and then chat to us. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to another great episode. You really enjoy it. Thank you very much. You make it worthwhile. Us recording them with these amazing treasure professionals right the way across the world, from the US, across the UK, across Europe. And there's lots more exciting guests to come and lots more live events. We love delivering this content. We get asked now, is this what you do? Do you just do content? Do you just do? No. The reason we do the content is to get to know you guys, to give you back the tips for success, if you like, but we're here to help you hire someone. If you need to recruit, call us because at our heart, we are a treasury recruitment company. That's how we pay the bills. That's how we pay for the podcast. And that's what we're passionate about. We hear from you at events and things. Can we also help you find your next great role? Can we help you hire? The answer is yes. That's exactly what we do. Yes, we do our treasury salary survey at treasurysalary.com. That helps us know exactly how to benchmark not only your salary, but also when you're looking to hire, we know exactly what the market is paying wherever you might be, whether it's the US, UK or Europe. We want to make sure that we are the best informed, that we're not just finger in the air. We always know. If you want to hire the best in treasury, don't hesitate to contact us. Go onto the website, treasuryrecruitment.com. Or for the US, you can contact Joe Grabowski. Europe, contact the lovely Katie for more senior roles and roles across the UK. Reach out and contact me. Or drop any of us an email. Joe at treasuryrecruitment.com. Katie at treasuryrecruitment.com. Or Mike at treasuryrecruitment.com. Let us help you make the hiring process as amazingly seamless and easy as our podcasts are to listen to. Thanks for your amazing support. I'm looking forward to seeing you at either an event or a conference very soon. Or just give me a call. Let's help you find the next role or recruit the next treasury professional. All right. Until next week.
Many thanks.